staying calm under pressure. January the year 2008, my Masi and I were driving. We were not in a hurry. But there was a pickup behind us with three, some, three young men. And boy, they were in a hurry. They were very upset with my driving speed. As they overtook us, they did me something like this. I didn't answer them. Why? Because I have no clue whether they were running away from a crime scene. I have no clue whether they were high on drugs. I have no clue whether they were attending to an emergency. By answering them back, I would have given them the opportunity to determine my attitude for the day and perhaps days to come. By answering them back, I would have empowered them to deflate my energy. By answering them back, I would have given them an opportunity to throw garbage onto me. It's Prime Minister Winston Churchill who said, if you stop to throw stones at every barking dog, you will never reach your destination. When the communists finished putting up Berlin Wall, a story is told how East Berliners collected trash, garbage, refuse, if you may, loads and loads, trucks and trucks of garbage, and threw on the other side of West Berlin. And for a while, West Berliners decided to revenge until the voice of reason from an elderly man spoke. We can't allow them to pull us to their level. Let's act in a diametrically different way. Let's read some cookies and some biscuits, some sodas, some water bottles on the other side of East Berlin. Let's be different. They did exactly that and then erected a huge banner and wrote these words. Each gives what each has. The question is, what do you have? Do you allow people to determine how you react? Or are you always under control? Are you able to respond despite the pressure people try to put on you? A dear friend of mine by the name Tim, he was then the CEO of the largest tea company in Kenya by the name Ketepa. One morning while he was driving to his office on a certain roundabout, there was another guy who was so much in a hurry, there was almost an accident. It was a near miss. And this other guy was so upset, he spoke some nasty words to Tim, and then he showed something to Tim with his middle finger. Well, my career does not allow me to illustrate. I leave it to your creative imagination. The guy was so much in a hurry. Why? He was headed for interview. Where? Ketepa. He reached there and realized that the chairman of the panel looks familiar. And he told the interviewing chairman, you look familiar. And the chairman of the panel, who happens to be the CEO, told him very much so. At the roundabout this morning, describes our familiarity. And the interviewee knew the interview is over. It was a high-end job. He was being interviewed for the director HR. And he lost his job that morning because he was nervous. He lost control because he thought he's losing on time. He's going to get late. Without realizing, he messed up with his interviewer. Learn to be calm even under pressure. November 2007, my family, Masi, Zig, Ivy, myself, were flying from Nairobi to San Francisco. Then we knew our flight was five in the afternoon. We reached the airport at one in the afternoon, way in advance. You can imagine my shock as I was pushing that trolley with our bags, and Masi was giving our tickets to the security guys at the airport to allow us in. The guy looks at Mercy and says, Madam, I'm so sorry. Your flight left five in the morning. We couldn't believe it. I was preaching that Friday. It was Wednesday night. We couldn't believe it. So I played strong. I told my kids and my mercy, this is my fault, but don't worry. Let's focus on what we can change. Let's come back at 1 a.m. just in case another family made the same blood that we made. 
On the inside, I was crushed. On the outside, I acted strong. And sure enough, when we went back to the airport at 1 in the morning, believe it or not, a family of four made the same mistake we made. And we got a chance to board the flight. Of course, we were penalized. We were charged $2,000 for that emergent, emergent um, uh, change of the flight. But God worked in mysterious ways. We reached San Francisco three hours ahead of the original schedule. The original flight was going through D.C. and Philadelphia after Turkey. The next one we got was from Istanbul all the way to SFO direct, three hours ahead of schedule. We remained calm. Many, many couples would have begun a fight and blame game. Now, realizing it's foolish. You will still be in the same flight. You have destroyed the environment for each other, and you will still be in the same home. Learn to be calm. Even under pressure. I'll never forget many, many years ago, I went to speak in a school. But a few miles to the school, the road was very narrow. And there was a public transport vehicle that blocked me along the way, picking and dropping passengers, picking and dropping passengers. At some point, I decided to stop the car where this guy stopped. And I went to him, and he thought I went to quarrel him. But I had a different agenda. There were no Google Maps then. I just asked him a simple question. Where is this school? And he knew it. And the driver graciously, he profusely apologized because the road was narrow and he kept on blocking me. And I was getting concerned. It was approaching 8 in the morning. One of the things I wanted to speak to the students was time management. But then he showed me where the school was. I was just about half a mile to the school. You can imagine my shock when I reached that school to realize that the principal and three other teachers were in that public transport vehicle. Had I called that driver names, I would have lost my integrity to speak about values to the school. More recently, in the year 2018, I, went, I was invited as a guest speaker in a praise-giving event in a high school. When I was just about to get into the school, there was a vehicle that hit my car so bad where my PA had sat, shuttling the, the door shuttling, ripping off the aging. The bang was so huge, the entire school actually came. The teachers, the parents, the students, and, and, and my secretary went into a huge, huge shock. And this was a new Mercedes-Benz I had just brought from, from UK. And the cops came very quickly, and I told the principal and the directors, let's put the situation under control. The school is bigger than me. And uh, I will deal with this case later. If you can give me one of the school drivers to handle the cops and the car, and I'll, I'll get back after the event. And the principal told me they're going to speed up the program. I said, no, -uh. run the program as you'd have done. You are many of you here gathered in your hundreds. The program and the people are bigger than me. And I spoke in that meeting, and then I gave the prizes to the Perform, to the students who had performed extraordinary, and to make the matter worse, I still took refreshments with the principal as they had originally planned before I now went to the police station in an Uber to sort out my mess. But I decided long ago, I will never put my value on property or money. I will never allow circumstances to control me because God is in control. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that are in Christ Jesus. I'm never in control of my life. October 11th, the year 2004, I lost my sister. We were born three in my family. One year, one year, one year. Between the firstborn and the lastborn, two years apart. We were very tight, very close. And I was invited in this school. They had tried to get me for over a year to speak. They blocked the entire afternoon for me to speak to the students. And when I reached there in that hall, five minutes before I was invited, I received a text that my sister has passed away and she's in such and such a hospital. That was three months prior to her wedding. Now, in fact, since that day, I always switch off my phone 30 minutes to my speaking engagement. So I switched off my phone, but I've already received the news. To this day, my entire life, that is by far the most devastating, catastrophic, overwhelming experience I've ever gone through. 
And here I am, and I knew I can tell the principal what has happened. I knew she would understand. I knew we can counsel speaking to the students. The teachers were there, the whole school was there. And I knew anybody in my situation would understand what I'm going through. It's very easy for your emotions to be very unstable. But I chose to go ahead, and I spoke for two hours nonstop and gave the students time, 30 minutes for Q&A. And I went for tea in the principal's office. Then I broke the news to her. This is my sister, but she fell from her seat. I kid you not. She collapsed. And what touched her the most was my calmness, my composure. And I'm here to say this. Learn to stay calm, even under pressure. I know it's not easy to be calm when your child is hit by a motorist, runaway motorist. It's not easy to be calm when your daughter is killed by her lover. A friend of mine lost her daughter to her lover last year. It's not easy to be calm when you lose a job and you have three or four or five children looking up to you and a landlord kicks you out of your house. It's not easy to be calm when a doctor discloses the news that you have been diagnosed with the so-called terminal illnesses. But you have to always ask yourself, what can you change? Learn to respond, not to react. What's the difference? Response is positive. React is negative. If you go to a doctor, and two weeks later the doctor says, uh-oh, we've got to change the prescription. Your body is reacting on the treatment. You get nervous. But if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, your body is responding to the treatment, we need to keep the same prescription. You relax. Why? Response is positive. React is negative. And I want to suggest today, if you lose your loved one, don't lose your mind, don't lose your faith. If you lose your job, don't lose your mind, don't lose your faith. Whatever comes your way, Learn to be calm under pressure. I gave you too many personal experiences for the sake of the validity of this message. It's very easy for someone to preach this message. It's another thing for them to share with you circumstances that they have gone through and they decided to be calm under pressure. I want to discuss with you three situations, three relationships where you must be calm under pressure. And the first one is parents and children. The second one is couples and debtors, and the third one is supervisors and subordinates. Let me start with parents and children. Because truth be told, children will do stuff that will make you feel like losing your mind. You raise a child in a godly way, and she comes back home pregnant. Don't kick her out of that house. You raise a boy in Sunday school, and he steals from you. Don't kick him out of that house. You will try to defend your child that they are not on drugs. Everybody else in the community knows except you. They will do stuff and you wonder, are these really my genes? And I'm suggesting today, never lose your mind. I read of a story of a man who bought a new car. And he decided to clean it up, to tune it up himself. Not knowing on the other side of the car, his four-year-old son was cribbing on the car, scratching it all over brand new car from the showroom. He lost his school, began beating the boy without realizing he was using a wrench. The four little fingers began to wither. He rushed the boy to the hospital. And on that hospital bed, a couple of doctors came and they all unanimously agreed all the four little fingers must be amputated. The man couldn't believe it. He banged the door behind him. He went down to the car park looked at the car again, looked at the scratches and realized they were not random scratches. The boy had simply scribbled, Dad, I love you. He couldn't take it anymore. And he committed suicide. Learn to respond, not to react. Ephesians 6.4 Fathers, some versions say parents, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Discipline you must, but never lose control. Never lose your calm. And that's why the Bible recommends something called a rod of discipline. Don't just use anything you find in the house. A bloom, throwing them to kids. 
And in fact, I always say this. It's only up to the age of seven where the rod of discipline needs to be used. That's the language kids understand. From the age of seven to 12, withdraw privileges, their chocolate, their bicycle time, their play time. From the age of 13 to 18 when they're teenagers, learn to negotiate with them. Learn to reason with them. Learn to ask them hard questions about the consequences of their actions. After the age of 19, don't worry. The government will help you. <laughs> yeah. Children, the word of God has a word for you. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. Verse 2. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Now notice, God commands little children below the age of 18 under the care of parents to obey their parents. But adult sons and daughters, like you listening to me here today, you are under no obligation to obey your parents. God commands you to honor. To honor does not mean to do everything they tell you to do, to agree with them. No, 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 no. To honor means don't be rude, don't be arrogant, don't get into an argument with your parents and support them financially as much as the Lord has blessed you in their old age. That's what honoring means. Matters, children, and parents, respect is not a two-way traffic. That means you must honor your parents even if they do not respect you. If you fight your parents, God will fight you. If you honor your parents, God will fight for you. Honoring parents is unconditional. It's a command. The Bible says this is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? That it may go well with you and you may live long life on the earth. A long, healthy, prosperous life. This is God's promise for honoring your parents. If they are rude and arrogant and mean with you, leave vengeance to God. Allow God to fight your battles. You don't have to win every battle. Learn to honor your parents. The second delicate relationship is between couples and those who are dating with the intention of marriage. If you are dating someone for marriage, and especially after you get married, trust me, they will tell you things, they will do things to you that will make your head to spin. You will feel like going berserk, losing it, literally. That's just a fact of life. Here is the deal. If you are in a marriage situation and feel like losing it, I recommend step number one, just count one to ten. And don't count before you speak. And don't count one, two, three, four, five, six. No, uh, uh. count slowly in your heart. Some, some people you need to count it openly for them to hear that you're trying to manage your tensions. One, two, they might even be a bit scared. If it does not work, drink some water. It will bring down your emotions. If it does not work, get out to the woods and take a walk. Nature has a way of reducing cortisol, the stress hormone. Or get on your laptop and begin to write all your feelings as they evolve and as they occur. You are creating a safe space for venting. And then when your emotions come down, for some of us it will take a couple of hours. For some of us several weeks. Once your emotions come down, delete that document. The Bible says do not keep a record of wrongs. But don't ever answer your partner in anger. The Bible says in Proverbs 15.1, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Many, many marriages collapse simply because someone reacted and the other one reacted. They both raised their voices, they raised their hands. Don't raise your voice in any argument. It is showers that make flowers grow, not thunders. You don't need to thunder. You only need to explain your point. If there is substance in your words, you don't need to raise your tone. How you say it matters. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word 
toss up anger. One thing leads to the other. And eventually you pull apart. Trust me, children of God. There is not a single marriage that is supposed to break. Marriages break because of one and only one reason. Someone reacted. It doesn't matter what your partner did, whether they cheated on you, whether they misappropriated money. Every relationship will stand people who are composed and calm. Any single relationship. The Apostle Paul challenges couples to dress appropriately, not to go out in the streets naked. He tells us to wear the shoes of gentleness, the pants of humility, a top of patience, a shirt or blouse of compassion, a belt of kindness, and a jacket, the outer coat of love. Gentleness, refusing to be harsh, refusing to be rough, no matter the situation, remaining calm. Humility, the ability to see the strengths in your partner and to work on your weaknesses, refusing to allow pride to take root in your heart. Patience, giving your partner time to reform and to grow, knowing that we are all work in progress and we all learn at different paces and faces in our lives. Compassion, being merciful, tender mercy, ability to forgive, extending a heart of grace to your partner, and kindness, being nice to one another, doing nice stuff for each other, buying flowers to your girl, buying a belt or a watch to your man, just being kind, being a nice person, and finally, wearing the jacket of love. Love covers a multitude of sins. That means love overlooks faults and focuses on the strength of your partner. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Don't get out of your house naked. Every morning, put on these clothes. Supervisors and subordinates, I guarantee you, promotion is not a factor of how many papers you have or even your experience. It is a question of whether you can take Pressure. Can you be composed under pressure? They don't pay the CEO more because he's brighter than you, smarter than you, more educated than you, more hardworking than you. They pay him more because he remains calm under pressure. They pay him more to deal with more problems. Every time you want to be promoted, you are asking God for higher, more complicated problems. If you always lose your cool when you're quarreled, when somebody shouts at you, if you always lose your cool, be sure you're not going to move any further than you are. If you have remained stuck at the same position for many years, check your composure. Let me draw a word to masters and then to employees. The Bible has a word to every boss listening to me here today. Philippians 4.5, let your gentleness be known to all men. You don't have to prove you are the boss. If you have to prove and to tell people you are the leader, you are not. Let me repeat that. If you must remind people, I'm the boss here, you are not a leader. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is not a title. Leadership is not a degree. It's weird how people tell me, I have gone to college and I did leadership. That didn't make you a leader. You just have a degree in leadership. It didn't make you a leader. Leadership is influence. Leadership is taking initiative. Leadership is guiding others. Leadership is role modeling what you want others to do. I don't tell you guys to come early. I am here early. The service starts at 10. I am here at 8.30. Only one man comes before me, Andrew. My goodness, he's made of a different material. Leadership is not telling others what to do. Is leading them in what to do. I don't tell you to pray. I pray first. That's leadership. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to demand it. People follow you because they want to, not because they have to. Titus 3.2, slander no one. Be peaceable and considerate and always be gentle toward everyone. Don't gossip anyone. Masters. 
Live at peace with everyone. Be considerate. People are going through different things, different situations, different circumstances. Always be gentle with everyone who comes to you. Be gentle with them. Why gentleness? Because they will make you upset too many times. They will not do what you want. They will fall short of your standards. Few people can perform like you. They may not be having your capacity. You might be able to work for 16 hours. The average person can work comfortably, optimally for 8 hours. Be gentle with everyone. Be considerate. They may not have the same capacity like you. And for those of us who are employed, the Bible has a word for you. Proverbs 25, 15. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. A gentle tongue can break iron bars. A gentle tongue can deal with the harshest critic, can deal with the most difficult boast. Sometimes you don't have to emphasize your point right now. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. Sometimes let him sleep over it. Sometimes pick up the issue next week. Be patient with him. And if you are gentle, you will be able to persuade your boss, your ruler, your master. For those of us who are students, especially graduate students, no matter your academic prowess and capacities, your graduation is paired to your ability to work with your supervisors. They will disagree with your conceptual framework. They will disagree with your problem study. They will disagree with you. They will throw you back to the drawing table. I'll never forget. When I was doing my PhD, we were defending three times. At the department level, at the faculty level, and at the university level, what we call the Senate. At the faculty level, we were three students. There was a student, in my considered opinion, who was much brighter than me. He was a lecturer of economics in Kenyatta University, a very brilliant guy. But in that particular defense, we were only three of us. He lost his school. And academically speaking, I listened to his arguments. My background is mathematics. I looked at the models he had come up with, and I knew he was right. Unfortunately, he lost on the most critical thing, social skills. He argued with the supervisor during defense. And not only did he fail on that defense, but he was kicked out for one academic year. I graduated all alone, the entire faculty. And I'm telling you, it's not because I was so bright or the most hardworking student. But one of the things I learned long ago, thanks be to Professor Chris, who taught me that no matter what they tell me, just say yes, sir. Take the points down, explain your case humbly, and where they don't understand or they don't agree with you, just say, point noted. I've understood what you've said. And go back and check what they said, even if you disagree with them. Don't be so strong-willed. This guy knew me. And he knew maybe I might push my case too hard. He told me, no, relax. Jacob, relax. Just listen to what they're telling you, even if you disagree with them. Leave to fight another day. Come and defend your work another time. And because I listened to the counsel of my elder, I literally graduated alone out of 108 students who registered for the program. 108 students. Let alone the gentleman I was talking about, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Solomon, he graduated. But that happened three years after my graduation. Humility will save you time, will save you money, will save you resources. Be gentle. You don't have to win the case. You would rather lose the case and win your marriage. You would rather lose the argument and win the soul. It is more important to lose the soul than to win the argument that Jesus is God. In conclusion, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Gentleness. Strength under control. God in flesh. But he didn't have to prove it on the cross. When he was being tempted by the devil using the voices of the soldiers. If you indeed are the son of God, get out of the cross. Prove you are God in flesh. He refused to succumb. He refused and he stayed on there. Gentleness. Strength 
under control. A horse is a powerful animal. A tamed horse is as strong as the wild stallions in the jungle. But it's tamed. It's under control. Gentleness is when your strength is tamed. It's under control. Will you receive it? Were well, you blessed by this message? Are you blessed by my ministry? I would like to invite you to be my ministry partner by sending me your love offering every month. I've shared with you the giving options on the screen. Help me to spread the gospel around the world. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload new videos. And if you're visiting the Atlanta Metropolis or you live around the Atlanta area, welcome to Family Church, 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia.